Hello, friends. I'm Peter O'Leary. Uh, you may recognize me as a lector at Ascension. I'm also a catechist. I want to offer you a reflection for the 21st Sunday in Ordinary Time. And uh, I'd like to begin by reading the Gospel from this week. This is a reading from the Holy Gospel according to John. Many of Jesus' disciples who were listening said, This saying is hard. Who can accept it? Since Jesus knew that his disciples were murmuring about this, he said to them, Does this shock you? What if you were to see the Son of Man ascending to where he was before? It is the Spirit that gives life, while the flesh is of no avail. The words I have spoken to you are spirit and life, but there are some of you who do not believe. Jesus knew from the beginning the ones who would not believe and the one who would betray him. And he said, For this reason I have told you that no one can come to me unless it is granted him by the Father. As a result of this, many of his disciples returned to their former way of life and no longer accompanied him. Jesus then said to the twelve, Do you also want to leave? Simon Peter answered him, Master, to whom shall we go? You have the words of eternal life. We have come to believe and are convinced that you are the Holy One of God. So I want to, as a way of reflecting on that, and also the other readings from this week, the first reading comes from Joshua. Uh, actually, the very end of, of the book of Joshua. And we also have a reading from Ephesians, um, a more complex reading. And I'll address that a little bit in a moment. But I want to begin by asking if you're familiar with the myth of the Holy Grail. Uh, surely... You've encountered it in legends, uh, children's retellings, books of myth, and maybe especially in popular culture, from you know Indiana Jones to Monty Python, personal favorite of mine. Uh, one of the earliest iterations of the Grail myth appears in something called the Conte du Graal by Chrétien de Troyes, who is a poet who lived in the second half of the 12th century and really about whom very little else is known. Um, he wrote in Old French, which is sort of similar to Old English in that they come from a parallel time, although I think Old French is probably more similar to modern French than Old English is to modern English. Um, Chrétien was a Christian, you can hear it in his name, and nearly all of the writings ascribed to him uh, belong to the Arthurian romances. So in Chrétien's iconic retelling or version of the Grail, which is also known as the Percival, uh, his hero, Percival le Galois, Percival the, the Frenchman, is a naive man-child who finds himself in an unknown place where, seeking guidance, he finds this strangely wounded man. He has this running open sore on his leg who's fishing in a boat in the middle of a lake, uh, and he asks this man where he might find a place to stay. And the man tells him that there's a castle close by. He'll be able to rest his horse there, and he can, he can nourish his hunger. So Percival makes his way over this hill to the castle, which actually belongs to the man who was in the boat. 
uh, also known as the Fisher King, and he invites him to a great feast. And so there, Percival, in this spectacular pageant, he witnesses one wondrous thing after another. There's this bone white spear, there's a drop of blood dripping down from its tip. There are these glorious and shimmering candelabra that are carried by these young maidens. And strangest of all, there's this great and glowing shallow platter, which is made of pure gold and studded with all kinds of precious stones. Um, now, before Percival departed from the forest where he, he grew up in, to pursue his life as a knight, an itinerant knight, his mother warned him never to ask questions lest he get into trouble. And Percival is naive enough that he took this completely to heart. Um, but seeing this pageant, he was curious. And the men who were carrying the platter, which was the grail, so it wasn't a cup, in, in Chrétien's version. The men who are carrying the platter, they take it to a room which is behind the throne of the Fisher King. And Percival's curious. He's just wondering who is served from the Grail. Clearly they're taking it somewhere and someone is, is being fed from it, presumably. And the description involves light and jewels, but there seems also to be food of some sort, nourishment on this this grail platter but instead Percival holds his tongue he watches in silence and he eats his portion of the feast and afterwards retires to bed so when he awakens in the morning he finds the castle completely empty um, but for his horse whom he mounts he rides away not knowing that his silence the evening before has actually cursed him how? Well, had he asked the question, who is served from the grail? He just simply had to ask the question. He would have freed the Fisher King from his own curse. Essentially, he would have begun the process of healing this open wound on his, on his leg, and that in, in turn would have begun the process of healing the parched land that surrounded the castle. This is the this is the, the wasteland that T.S. Eliot made famous in his poem of the same title. So Percival was a naive and simple fool. We know that, but even Percival must have known, uh, you know, in the words of the immortal words of, of Bob Dylan, you got to serve somebody. Um, he w himself was in service. It's not such a strange thing to ask that question. So, in the first reading from this week, Joshua is unequivocal. We will serve the Lord, he states. He offers the Israelites gathered with him at Shechem a choice. They can decide whom they will serve, but for himself and for his household, we will serve the Lord. Service, serving, that's the theme. Ephesians. We get a more complex depiction of service here. Um, one expressive of what scholars of the New Testament called call household, I'm sorry, household code. Um, and you know, the, the gist of this is straightforward. Wives are subordinate to the husbands. Children are subordinate to fathers. Slaves are subordinate to masters. Now, it's commonplace in the contemporary church to edit this reading to something a little less objectionable than that. Um, But uh, disagreeable as the sentiment is, and I should note here that uh, scholarly consensus, uh, Raymond Brown says it's around 80%, um, 
does not believe that St. Paul is the author of Ephesians. But his name is signed to it. Uh, so disagreeable, disagreeable as that sentiment is, um, shouldn't we at least acknowledge it, even if we can't quite come to terms with it? Um, service involves subordination. And that's what Ephesians records for us. So Joshua says, we will, we will serve the Lord. Ephesians points out that service is subordination. <clears throat> I think the reading from John's Gospel, which we just read together, shows Jesus responding to the puzzlement of his disciples, whose inability to understand his words clearly annoys him. Jesus is annoyed that they don't seem to understand. This saying is hard. Who can accept it? He's like, come on. So after upbraiding them, that's what he's, in my sense of things, that's what he's doing when he responds to them. Many of the disciples just leave. And as it says, they return to their former way of life. They'd had enough. It was too complicated, too hard for them. Um, at that point, Jesus asks the twelve, do you also want to leave? Which prompts Peter, uh, in a kind of echo of Joshua, to ask, to whom shall we go? To whom shall we go? He's prepared to offer himself in service to Jesus, which means a form of subordination. Okay, so ask yourself this week, whom do I serve? And be honest. You can serve family and friends, but can you subordinate yourself to that service? That can be hard when it comes to family, can't it? Especially when you're the you know, the dad or the mom. Like, can I subordinate myself to that service? That's a tough one. You can also serve the causes of justice in human and environmental rights, for instance. These are, those are both very important to me. Um, and you can even serve God. But, being honest, don't you also serve yourself? at least by serving power, money, favorable opinion of the people around you. There are all sorts of things that we serve and we complexly, problematically subordinate ourselves to those, to those services. So, to whom shall you go? Will you spend your days like Percival in the wasteland, searching in vain for an answer to this question? Or can you find a way with some confidence to, to say who it is you are serving? So in conclusion here, I'd like to offer a little prayer of service. This comes from uh, an early Scottish source. That's all the information that I have about it, but it's a beautiful, it's a beautiful offering, and maybe will help us all gain some perspective on the question: who it is that we're serving. I am giving thee worship with my whole life. I am giving thee assent with my whole power. I am giving thee praise with my whole tongue. I am giving thee honor with my whole utterance. I am giving thee reverence with my whole understanding. I am giving thee offering with my whole thought. I am giving thee praise with my whole fervor. I am giving thee humility in the blood of the Lamb. I am giving thee love with my whole devotion. I am giving thee kneeling with my whole desire. I am giving thee love with my whole heart. I am giving thee affection with my whole sense. I am giving thee my existence with my whole mind. I am giving thee my soul 
O God of all gods. Amen. Blessings one and all in the week to come and in these waning days of summer. And I look forward to seeing you in church.